okay? They're often, because we want to reduce the variables, we keep them in a very small cage by themselves, <clears throat> okay? However, rats that are allowed the opportunity to exercise via running, via, uh, via a running wheel, uh, consistently perform better on spatial memory tasks. Rats that are provided a complex environment or an enriched environment uh, with opportunities for exploration, exercise, and greater social interaction perform still better on the same task than their more impoverished peers. So not only just having the running wheel, but putting them in interaction with other rats and moving things around so that they can constantly explore their world, they actually perform better on spatial memory tasks. <clears throat> Anatomically, rats raised with the running wheels and rats raised in complex environments uh, actually have, high, have higher newborn neural survival rates. So they are actually able to maintain the neurons within their brains over a longer period of time over the course of their life. And uh, additionally, they act, we actually find that they uh, exhibit greater um, uh, dendritic uh, branching. Okay? Neuro uh, we don't, for the most part, we don't grow any new neurons in our life from birth. Uh, mo we have basically, we are born with all the neurons we are going to ever need. And uh, over the course of our life, we basically lose neurons. But we, but we can find that there are effects on neuronal branching uh, by just by having exercise and social interaction. Uh, this causes one to pause and, and think about uh, whether dropping exercise time from the class schedule uh, so students can have more time to study is really a prudent and well thought out idea. I doubt that uh, principals that do this have actually gone through and done the research to, to validate uh, their behaviors. <clears throat> Evidence of the environment upon human brain structure comes from the British Nobel laureate, Dr. Eleanor McGuire. Uh, taxi drivers in London must negotiate an elaborate tangle of roads uh, from memory. Uh, as such, a great deal of their time is spent using spatial memory, uh, which is associated with the hippocampus region of the brain. In her, re in her research, Dr. McGuire found that taxi drivers have a larger hippocampus than the control group, than the average individual. Additionally, the size of the right hippocampus among taxi drivers increases according uh, to how long the individual has been a taxi driver. So how long we've been a taxi driver actually affects the size of our brain or specifically the hippocampus region of the brain. <clears throat> we also have ocular dominance columns. Okay? And I'm going to try to connect this again to the idea that we move in attractor states. The retinal ganglion neuron, which is in our eye, transmits directly to the lateral geniculate nucleus. The neurons of the lateral geniculate nucleus synapse directly onto the fourth layer neurons of the visual cortex. So what this means is that we have, we have information from both the left and the right eye are, is directly synapsing onto a single neuron in the fourth level of the visual cortex, okay? Initially. <clears throat> Near the time of birth, the visual cortex neuron within our visual cortex back here will affix itself to the afferent, which is the incoming information, of one eye or the other. It's a coin toss, 50-50. However, which eye the neuron affixes to is influenced by its neighbors. There is a clustering effect that occurs of the neurons attaching to each eye. 
These are known as ocular dominance columns, and we can see uh, their formation uh, after two weeks after birth, following three weeks, six weeks after birth, and then 16 weeks. And we can see right here that the dark areas versus the light areas. And these are basically domains or regions of neurons that have affixed to the right eye or the left eye. <clears throat> Here's a top-down cutaway view of the ocular dominance columns. I've included again the, Ising, the mathematical Ising model of ferromagnetization. I'm not saying that they are the same. What I am asking you to do though is look at the similarities. Is again, these ocular dominance, the, the neurons initially synapse on both, thus basically giving it a, a zero bias. And then, over time, over a reasonably short period of time, they end up, boom, going to one side or the other side, and they end up, we end up getting this clustering effect. <clears throat> there is a reason why I'm telling you all this, by the way. Don't think there's not a reason. <clears throat> uh, if we are ethically dubious enough, uh, we can restrict the input of the visual stimulation according to uh, originating from the left eye or right eye in cats. And here we can see the results of doing so in cats. So this is after their visual, their ocular dominance columns have already formed. We then, this is later in life, we will we'll basically sew their eye shut, their left eye or their right eye, and you will see that it then again continues to affect the formation of the structure of the brain is continually affected later on into life. So again, this, this adds to the support of probabilistic epigenesis, that the structures of the brains are not predetermined, is that they actually will change depending upon uh, the interaction with the environment. <clears throat> um, I'll skip some of the informa some more information where we, we actually have taken uh, the nerves of the uh, retinal ganglion of the eye and we separate it from the visual cortex and we connect it to the auditory cortex. And what happens is that the auditory, the, the neural patterns of the auditory cortex change and begin to take on the patterns normally associated with the visual cortex. Um, again, kind of ethically dubious uh, questionable um, science, but at the same time, though, very interesting and useful. <clears throat> so, if this is the case, that we have these neural patterns that are forming from the interactions of the individual neurons, given the information coming in, well, you want to say then, well, but don't these then, don't these neural patterns then feed back onto the, uh, our, uh, the, the, the behavior of the neurons? And the answer is actually yes. I'll skip, I'll skip this. The bidirectionality of visual perception. Again, we can look at this picture and you are predisposed to seeing a human face. This is, again, a result of us bringing our uh, our own, our, what we want to see to the process of sight. <clears throat> okay? The traditional view was, uh, and this is uh, associated with um, developmental psychology, is that we have the maturational approach, in which genes affect structure, affect function, affect experience, the way that we experience things. However, the contemporary view, uh, and this is regarding function, is what's known as interactive specialization. This complements uh, probabilistic epigenesis. The functional properties of a cerebral region are the results of that region's connectivity to afferents, sensory neurons, and other regions and their immediate and historic patterns of activity. Again, historic patterns of activity. So what we see here is again that structure affects function, affects structure. Structure affects Function affects experience, except affects function. Is it's all going back and forth um, in a dynamic manner. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, by the way, uh, this does not challenge the existence of sensitive periods or observed stages of development. Uh, I suspect that the sensitive periods and stages of development can be accommodated uh, using a complexivist framework, uh, but I haven't had much time actually to read about that. Uh, this interactive um, specialization is supported by, um, um, again, more ethically dubious but important uh, research um, in regards to um, rats and rodents, um, uh, but I'll, I'll skip most of that. In an effort to accommodate for linguistic representations that are fundamentally context sensitive, but also support grammatical behavior which appears to be abstract and, ge and general, Je Jeffrey Ellman developed a recurrent neural network model. So again, going back here is that we have the process of feedback. He cr created a network model that, that included this process of recursion. And I believe he was one of the first people to do this, although it's generally uh, widely used these days now. Okay, so for the perception of a visual object is again we have interactions between the sensory structures and the processing structures. We have the information coming in. We have the perception of the visual object that then feeds back. Let's look at the evidence. <clears throat> Barr et al. conducted a series of experiments examining visual object recognition, and domain-specific cortical activity. Whereas the temporal cortex is typically associated with object rec recognition, and that's the uh, cortex right back here, okay? <clears throat> uh, their research found that the orbitofrontal cortex, the OFC right here, uh, was also active slightly before and slightly after the fusiform area of the temporal cortex. The orbital frontal cortex is, uh, is a region of the prefrontal cortex that is normally associated with semantic processing uh, that occurs only once an object is recognized. Uh, again, the prefrontal cortex is a lot of what we call our uh, executive function, our higher level thinking, rather than just our sensory thinking. <clears throat> Not only was there activation of the orbital frontal cortex, uh, but he found that there were differences in the activation of the orbital frontal cortex 50 microseconds uh, before differential activations in the temporal cortex, normally associated with successful or unsuccessful object recognition. I'll try to explain this to you here. Okay, this chart right here is showing the difference, the difference between successful object recognition and unsuccessful object recognition. Okay, so we can see here that there is actually a difference between successful object recognition and unsuccessful object recognition in the orbitofrontal cortex, this region right here. But, not initially, is that there is... a spike in activity of the left fusiform, I'm sorry, I apologize, of the right fusiform area. I believe this is, yes. Sorry, the right fusiform area, right here, there is initially a spike in activity. The right fusiform area is associated with a very low spatial um, information processing, fuzzy, images, okay, low, low spatial frequencies is associated with this region right here. We see a spike in the activity that then ends up resulting in a spike in the activity here that is usually associated with high level executive function, high level thinking. So what we believe happens here is, and, and then only then do we see changes, significant changes in the right hemisphere and the left, left hemisphere of the fusiform only after this difference in spiking of recognition or non-recognition. What this is telling us is that the high level, the orbitofrontal cortex is communicating 
to the regions associated with vision what the object likely is. So, when we see something, it, we're, we're, look, we're operating on mi microseconds here, okay? You can't actually consciously think in microseconds, okay? But what, we, what we're seeing is that when we see something initially, is that it is, there is a fuzzy image that is communicated very quickly to the frontal cortex that is then relayed back to the areas associated with vision. So it's showing us that we do not actually just see what we see. We actually see what we think we see. <clears throat> Have I lost everyone? <clears throat> In essence, experience affects the formation, and formation affects how future experience will be internalized. And again, you can see how this would help us maintain that idea of life and the maintenance of structure while maintaining dynamism. And the, again, this is an explanation for the reason why you might see motion in this, and why you have difficulty looking at this, is that these illusions are breaking your expectation for what you will see. That's why it's, you can't look at this very long. You have to blink your eyes. It's because this is breaking your expectations for what you think you will see. And the reason why you have motion here is because your brain here is actually having to continually reprocess what it's seeing because it, this breaks your understanding of reality. Hence, an illusion. <clears throat> Sensor motor coordination and behavior as a dynamic system. Um, in an effort to conserve time, I'll, I'll just lightly touch on this. Okay, um, Some of the recent developmental psychology literature regarding sensor motor coordination and behavior as a dynamic system. Again, this is all very interesting and exciting to me. Uh, maybe not so much you, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> uh, we will start with soft assembly uh, of the sensor motor behavior. Soft assembly is easier to understand via analogy. If we are hanging wallpaper on the wall, okay, we prepare and we consciously organize our approach to hanging wallpaper, such as starting in the corner, or maybe we will start at the top and work down, or start at the bottom and work up. However, we do not plan, uh, th this planning only goes so far. We do not plan each arm movement, each movement of the hand or the head or foot movement, nor can we anticipate every troublesome bubble in the paper or other problem that inevitably occurs. When we reach for a pen, we don't think about the angle of our hand nor the real-time adjustments made by our arms or fingers. Soft assembly is a confluence a unity of, of processes and structures involved unconsciously in real time to accomplish or attempt to accomplish the task at hand. Ultimately, there is no sensor motor function. All function is merely adaptive, real time, self organized sensor motor coordination given the dynamics and constraints of all contact, of all components in context. In a sense, any sensor motor coordination is, is a real-time attractor in a state of relative metastability, which Kello, Kello, Van Orden, uh, Kello and Van Orden describe as a balance between independence and interdependence among component activities. All components are constantly reorganizing according to a multitude of internal and external factors to achieve performance on the immediate task. Let, hopefully this will work. Sweet, that one works. Okay, numerous coordinative patterns can exist at any moment. I'm going to start with, for example, walking. Okay, when I walk, 
I have what's called a gait, a gait to my walk. That is the way that my feet will move back and forth. Now, there is stability to this pattern that I'm walking. And you will also notice is that there's also a complementary coordination of activity with my arms swinging as well. This is all related to the physical body as I'm, as I'm walking. Now, at some point when I'm walking, I will accelerate and I'll start jogging. Now, when I begin jogging, it would look silly if I jog with my arms down the same as walking. It looks silly, right? And the reason why is because what happens is that we actually have a coordination is as I start jogging, my arms move up into a new attractor state. Okay? I've changed from my state of walking to a new state of jogging. And in the process of that state shift, of that change of attractor states, my arms also undergo a change as well. However, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. They are not connected in a one-to-one -one way. Because, as we can see here, people can walk and also maintain the, a different attractor state, in this case here, the hands being up, and normally what we associate with, what we associate with, with running. Okay, and note the scale of this is only an observable scale. Okay, this is an example of coordination of sensor motor activity. Okay, well let's look at this at, at a, a developmental level rather than as a, at a fully developed level. <clears throat> okay, evidence supporting the claim that sensor motor behaviors our attractors in states of metastability comes from the work of Christopher Kello and Guy Van Orden. Oh, I'm missing my notes. Thank you. Have they been there the entire time? <clears throat> yeah, all of you know Damon, buddy, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, Kello and Van Orden hypothesize that if sensor motor functions are soft assembled as metastable patterns, then 1F scaling should pervade the intrinsic fluctuations of sensor motor neural and behavioral activity. 1F scaling, also known as 1F noise or pink noise, is a power law property um, uh, exhibited or prevalent in many fields, especially in biology. Okay, remember that complex systems have difficult to distinguish boundaries. Yet there is the absolute need for structure. Structure that absolutely couples and bootstraps with dynamism. 1F scaling indicates a balance of independence and interdependence across scales. Okay, so I'll, tr I'll try to, to I'll try to uh, explain this to you a little bit here. Is that here we have an example of what's called pink noise. Hopefully you can see well. Is that the transition from yellow to red happens at a gradient? Okay, a kind of gradient level. Okay, in which the energy ends up being diffused equally across all, across all levels. If it's completely uniform, we get what's called white noise, which is when our 1 over F uh, approaches the zero power. Okay, whereas here we have 1 over F approaching 1. This is, this is an example of pink noise. We have Brownian noise, uh, which is where our function equal, is, equals the uh, squared function equals 2, and this is very high structure. And you can see in these examples here is that we have a uh, much higher structure in this brown noise. There's less, there's less random noise. Okay? But again, we, can, we have to find a balance between random noise, and which is dynamism, and structure. Okay, so we're looking to achieve this 1F scaling where the F uh, is to a power of 1. 
excuse me. Okay, 1F scaling actually has been found in a var wide variety of behavioral studies. Kello et al. measured the acoustic, uh, Kello et al. Uh, measured the acoustic fluctuations of spoken words using logarithmic scales of power and frequency. They found that the production of syllables, uh, an unconscious sensor motor process, exhibits patterns of 1F scaling uh, s between measured frequencies. We have a variety of measured, measured frequencies here. Okay, they actually, what they did is they had people repeat the word bucket, or buckets, many, many times in a row. Buckets, 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 buckets. About a thousand times, okay? And again, what we're going to show here is that we're able to maintain the syllables of buck and kits, but at the same time, though, there are actually fluctuations, is that the, the syllables are not precise. The syllables are not specific. <clears throat> they found that the production of syllables uh, actually exhibited 1F scaling at measured frequencies. Um, they, they measured the, uh, the, the variation, the noise between the frequencies, and they found that basically, on, in general, it approached the, re the, the regions of 1, one, F, uh, 1 over F scaling to the first power. <clears throat> okay? This indicates that syllables, that the syllables that our bodies produce and the states that our bodies use to produce them are not precise. Rather, they are precise enough. Our sensorimotor processes, even the, and even the syllables of our language, are inexact attractor states that exhibit a great deal of fluctuation, but not excessive fluctuation. Kello et al. argues that the observed pervasiveness of 1F scaling in speech reflects the fact that cognitive functions are formed as metastable patterns of activity in brain, body, and the environment. Uh, developmental psychologists Smith and Thalen assert that all sensor motor behavior is an attractive state. Crawling, suckling, infant stepping, perservative reaching, and infant grasping are all examples of extractor states that self-organize according to the context of all the variables at play. I actually wanted to include a lot of their research uh, in this presentation, but I just don't have the time. Uh, they cite Lewis's scales of emotional development, which categorize immediate emotional episodes, your immediate maybe mood, or your immediate feelings, as uh, in the realm of attractors. Oops, Okay, media emotional episodes, and that these actually are attractor states, as we identify here. <clears throat> uh, moods as temporary changes in the state space available to an attractor, and personality as a permanent structure of state space. Uh, I somewhat disagree. I agree, but I somewhat disagree. I would actually go further in that uh, uh, personally... I suspect that moods, personalities are also attractors, just at different scales than emotional episodes. Okay, uh, although I under I understand why they organized it this way. If you have the time and interest, I really recommend uh, reading about soft assembly and dynamic field theory. Um, these are. Uh, especially if you're interested in developmental psychology, uh, which, uh, if you're going to be a future elementary school teacher, you probably should be, although I hate to use that word should, you probably should be interested in developmental psychology. Uh, all of this is uh, included in the reference section of your packet. <clears throat> now we'll move to the self-organization of language. Oh, don't worry, we still have more sections. Few, fewer laughs now. Okay, so language, as you might have guessed it at this point, uh, cannot be separated from the neuronal, physiological, or sensor motor development. 
And it isn't... And going in the opposite direction, language cannot be separated at any level from the external environment. This is some really interesting research. Okay, evidence present, presented by Wilson et al. shows how the auditory, okay, the auditory and laryngeal systems are structurally coupled together with each other via the network of the brain. When we speak, auditory regions within the brain replicate the sound of speech, and when we listen, speech productive regions within the brain replicate the gesture of the speech in accordance to the perceived sound. So when we hear, we actually re replicate the sound that we think we hear with our, with our vocal system in our brain. We, actually, we don't speak when we hear because we, we actually repress uh, that um, uh, activity. Okay, so Pierre E. Odier demonstrated how vowel phonemes, phonemes can self-organize given the physiology of the human auditory system laryngeal system, and the brain. Odier used an initially random connectionist uh, network model. So here we have a, a random, initially random model. Oops, sorry. I must have skipped. Here we have initial, initially random models. Okay. <clears throat> he then connected these models, which are, which are symbolically shown right here. He then connected these models together with an auditory model. Yeah. With a laryngeal model. Okay, and this creates an individual agent. Okay, so he has a model of how we believe the laryngeal system to work, with a, a system of how we believe the ear to work. He connects them together using a heavy and learning connectionist learning model here. Okay? And he then showed how these phonemes will actually self-organize. <clears throat> Each agent, agent one here, would make a random, a random vocalization, which could only be, which would only be heard by one other random agent. And he would use twenty random agents. So he has different agents. One agent makes a random sound. This sound is only heard by one other random agent. Okay? He showed that through random interaction between individual agents, communal phonemes would actually form. They would form into these regions of attractors. <clears throat> uh, and this would occur actually after fewer than 2,000 interactions. Okay? These artificial phonemes resulting from his experiment, arranged themselves into uh, basins of attraction. And these basins of attraction actually are the common basins of attraction that we, uh, that we find in many phonological systems. Okay, these, these common uh, phonological basins of attraction. So for example here, uh, we have uh, the most common of the world of the world's phonological uh, vowel systems actually have five vowels. Okay, A E I O U in the case of English. Okay, this is actually the most common system, and you can see how these actually ended up forming. Again, there was no planning to this; just using a, a model of the ears and the way that the ear and the laryngeal system communicate with through a heavy learning model, and we communicate with other people. <coughs> Is actually roughly accorded with actually the, uh, uh, the the phonetic systems that we find in the real world. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, using data from uh, the UCLA Phonological Segment Inventory Database, uh, which includes uh, 317 different vowel systems. Okay, so again, we can see how this fits within our complexity diagram is that we had individual models, and these individual models were fairly complex, 
They randomly interacted with each other that then resulted in patterns of formation within their neural systems that then fed back into how they interacted with each other. In this case, the information coming in was the running of the program. The organization of fundamental speech structures, phonemes, is rooted within the physiological domain. Yet, it also extends beyond our physical domain and it extends beyond the confines of our individual body. Because again, we needed individuals to result in the formation of phonemes, individuals interacting with each other. So again, the formation of the basic structures of speech, we cannot achieve alone. We cannot achieve by ourselves. So our cognition is actually fundamentally connected with other people. The cognitive linguistic development of the individual involves structural coupling and mutual bootstrapping with other individuals. <coughs> This represents our kind of first glimpse into what's known as distributed cognition, okay? Uh, cognition on a scale beyond ourself. At another level of cognition, researchers have found evidence of a plausible explanation for the self-organization of linguistic categories relative to visual perception through shared interaction. Belpame and Steele's used language games to compensate for the absence of an innate lexical structure. Language games integrate a variety of systems, vision, gesture, speech production, speech reception, and responsive actions. All of these systems are unified via a binary event. Again, going back to uh, the positive spin of the electron or the negative spin of the electron. A binary event of success is yes or failure is no. Okay? And perhaps in reality this is indicated by a nod or a shake of the head. Okay? So this is how we can maybe move from the physical body to uh, system, organizing systems of knowledge and in this case lexicons. Belpain and Steele's constructed models of individual agents that all shared uh, identical perceptual apparatus. So all of the robots that they used were the same. Okay? And they assigned random words uh, to their own internally constructed perceptual categories. Okay? And these were color categories. Uh, the, the robots did otherwise did not share did not share categories or lexicons. There was no central cognitive governing linguistics or perceptual categorization between the agents. Okay. The experiment that they constructed was grounded in that we had phonological system, phonological symbols are, are coupled to the environment through the sensory apparatus. It is embodied we have apparatus and processing reflects human physiology. It is situated, and that interaction is embedded in the context of communicative acts in a shared real-world setting, and is cultural. Agents are part of a population with recurrent interactions between the members. <clears throat> now, colors are not clean. Okay? They are fuzzy. For example, uh, for example, each individual agent in this experiment perceived a variety of topics, in this case, random colors selected from a set of 1,269 Munsell chips. And they were assigned a random word. And we already saw how, how the, uh, uh, the symbols of speech can already be self-organized. The color categories, though, were not precisely distinguishable. For example, is this maroon or crimson? I'll give you a minute if you need to leave. It's no problem. 
Is this maroon or crimson? This is what we normally will associate with crimson. This is what we will normally associate with maroon. These are established culturally. How do you establish this? It's very difficult. It's very fuzzy. The perceptual color realms were characterized by a radial function. For, uh, for example, in this case, this would end up going to one side or the other, fairly, um, depending on probably small changes. Okay. What we found, this is before interaction, is that where there was color, two agents here, we have color... The agents end up color coding themselves. Again, we're using a, a, a Munsell spectrum right here. The agents end up color coding into regions, into domains of words that are lexicon that is associated with color. Although you will notice is that there is differences between both of them. You can see there are similarities. The similarities result from their interaction with the environment, not their interaction with each other. We get similarities here before they interact. Then, these robots began interacting. They put the robots in a room, they put random objects in the room, a robot would then say a word according to its lexicon, and the other robot would then point at what it thought was that word, what that word represented. If it was incorrect, a failure, the other robot would shake its head and then point at the correct, or what it thought was the correct object. The next robot would then perform the same function. So again, there's no idea of right or wrong, of correct or incorrect. But what we find here then is over time, with the robots interacting with each other, is that regions will coordinate themselves. There is the coordination of color categories with no organizing factor. These self-organize themselves via the interactions of the individuals within their environment. Uh, and it's not, they're not perfectly they're not perfectly organized. Again, it is an imperfect system, um, as is our communicative system. It's imperfect. Okay. Um, again, I find this is this is this. If you're interested in linguistics, this is really interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, let me find where I am here. 